All right, we are on the home stretch now of TechCon day three. Uh, I'm your host of the cloud native development and application modernization track, Andy Harmon. Um, hope you guys had a chance to get inspired by some of the fascinating perspectives that uh, Mark Randolph has to offer and has offered in the past uh, three days. Um, don't forget to ask questions, make comments in the, in the chat. Um, we learn from you just as much as you learn from us. Uh, and uh, and we'll also be having another office hour at the end of the day, but we've got two uh, sessions left for uh, today's track. Um, and with that, I'm going to flip it over to Kurt Chadrick, who's going to talk about some of our mainframe application modernization options. Uh, Kirk, over to you. Great. Thank you, Andy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this session. We're going to talk about Accelerate Mainframe Application Modernization with IBM Z Systems and Cloud. And uh, probably as a backdrop, I think what, I, what we should probably do here in the, in the early part is, is to really talk about uh, kind of this idea around how hyper cloud strategy, hyper cloud architecture, how that fits in with uh, multi-cloud, right? They're, they're, uh, they overlap. They're not exactly the same thing, but they do overlap and there's definitely some synergies there. And I think in the context of, especially that hyper cloud architecture, uh, view. Um, that's, I think, where a lot of the uh, discussion that we're going to have and things we're going to kind of point out and bring up uh, will fit nicely um, in terms of, uh, of how we move forward, and it's, at least in this session. And then uh, feel free to, uh, you know, reach out to me uh, as needed after the session if you want, and uh, I'd be glad to talk about some of these things. Uh, a little bit of, real quickly about me. I, I am Kurt Chedrick. I have global responsibility for uh, what we call our enterprise DevOps uh, and modernization solutions. So um, I've been doing modernization in various forms, uh, mostly around applications and, and uh, the development environment itself and practice uh, for, uh, well, a long time. I started when I was young, I'll put it that way. Uh, last uh, 15 years specifically for uh, for IBM focused on uh, in this space. So um, so it's a, something that's near and dear to my heart and uh, um, we have a lot of uh, good, um, I think ideas and, and things that we're doing from an IBM perspective, we're seeing a lot of organizations move forward uh, with these. And it's just, uh, it's a very fun area and a very fun time because it's constantly moving, as I'm sure most of you are uh, already aware of. So let's kind of jump into it. I think one of the things that, that kind of catches a lot of people off guard is, is uh, something like this, right? In, in the era of cloud, uh, for example, where you see that uh, the, uh, the actual Processing on the mainframe has continued to grow at an exponential rate, three times growth. And if you know, if you kind of think about where that fits on a graph standpoint, you know, you see that middle bar there, 2016, 2015 is right around where you know the cloud, um, you know, phenomenon, so to speak, started and movement kind of got cranked up. Um, so you can kind of see since then, it, it's just been phenomenal, and it's and it's both in the uh, standard uh, engines as well as the regular general purpose engines. Now, you can look to the right and see how that maps out in terms of types of organizations, right? 67 of 100, Fortune 100, 45, top 50 banks, A to 10 insurers, et cetera. Um, and I think it's interesting because as we, as we look at where hyper cloud is moving or where cloud is moving, um, you know, we, we've seen this, similar dynamic happen in, in, in uh, tech initiatives in the past, right? Client server was a, was a good example. Uh, SOA was a good example. I had my own company back in those days, and I remember we whiteboarded a whole lot on service-oriented architecture, right? And, and of course, the initial response was, oh, we got to service-orient everything. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, we kind of calmed down a little bit and thought, well, maybe that's not the best thing. Uh, maybe we don't really need that. As a matter of fact, maybe there are certain applications that being tightly coupled together gives us the performance, and the performance is what we need more than any of the other characteristics that uh, that might be looking at. And I think the same thing kind of happened with cloud, and we're seeing that uh, maturing uh, as it goes through. I think uh, the you know its its paces, so to speak, within various organizations. And you know, initially with cloud, I think a lot of kind of uh, a lot of organizations kind of responded to um, you know, cloud's the answer, what's the question kind of a, an approach. And, and cloud at that point was really defined uh, in response to the where question, right? Um, 
it's if it's off prem, it's cloud, right? And and cloud's the better thing to do. So we got to get our stuff off prem. And and I think uh, even when hyper cloud started to become more prevalent in terms of a, a, a terminology and a strategy, you know, you still had some analysts and certain uh, not not any of the major analysts really, but some other analysts. I read some articles where you know they said, oh, you know, hybrid is the, just code word for on prem, right? It, which is really kind of a reflex backward, you know, pendulum swing backward to if cloud answer is is where and it's off prem, then that means hybrid means you're trying to trick us to get things back on prem. And really, it's neither of those. And I think that's what really I think is the exciting part about this, um, this aspect of what's going on in the industry around cloud and what organizations are doing. So, you know, when you look at, again, a chart like this, sometimes I think people are taken back and they're like, wow, I thought everybody was moving workload off. Well, you know, that kind of leads us to the next point, because, you know, here is and I realize this is a little bit dated. Most of you have probably seen this. Uh, this was from uh, 2018 from the IDC study. Uh, where we were talking about, or they were looking at this concept around repatriating, right? Uh, basically, now, now the definition around that uh, for a lot of people was bringing things back on prem. I think the reality is we 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 try to get sometimes too narrow with some of these uh, labels that we put on there because really, when you start to think about the value of cloud, specifically hyper cloud. That portability aspect, being able to move workloads where they make sense, means that you know I, I have the luxury now, or I have the ability, uh, hopefully, if I'm doing this correctly, that I can move my workload depending on what I need from a business perspective. You know, at that point, so I, I, I like to use the term business performance uh, when when we're thinking about uh, our applications and the workloads that sit on these these various uh, platforms, because I think that's ultimately what kind of encapsulates you know the the breadth and depth really of, of what we're looking at, right? So when you start to look at something like this and you say, you know, specifically those columns on the right there or the bars on the right, you know, the first and the third one, you know, the on-prem uh, cloud, non-cloud, on-prem public cloud, uh, the, the whole idea of on-prem, right? In both of those scenarios from 2018 and 2019, the trend was increasing, right? Well over 50%. Um, but again, I think if you look at these numbers in isolation, you, you often come to the wrong conclusion. Um, and I think the conclusion that a lot of people are moving things back off on-prem is real. I mean, that the data is there, but why is really kind of the, the, the thing that we want to talk about a little bit today. Uh, because I think, you know, the aspect of it is, is that there are certain kinds of workload that should be on the mainframe. Uh, the mainframe does it best. Uh, and especially when you think about those high transaction workloads, um, you know, uh, I think it was still like 98%, I think in the last report we, we saw of financial transactions still, you know, happen on the back end, right? There's nothing that processes those things like the, the mainframe platform. And, you know, the fact that some organizations have not modernized their mainframe is part of the problem why it's difficult for them now to take the mainframe and make it part of that hyper cloud architecture. Um, back leveled on hardware, they may be back leveled on. And, and a lot of that was a result of, you know, um, the thought initially with cloud, oh, we're going to move everything off, right? So as things start to really start looking at business performance, um, you know, we're, we're trying to understand really what's kind of in that top right there, right? That most organizations, they're really looking for a way to manage the estate that accommodates cost, performance, and governance requirements for different workloads and do it in a way that's consistent and that they can standardize across all platforms. So I, I like to kind of think of it as not only portability, but now you have the ability to innovate anywhere you want. Um, yeah, I mean, when you think of something like Java, for example, where you know the promise is you know, right once, run anywhere. Well, Java runs on the platform on, on ZOS, or on Z, I should say, uh, ZOS and you know, within CICS uh, subsystems as well as within Linux on Z. Um, really better than just about any other place. Uh, and the benchmark, you know, stuff is all there. So the question is now I don't have to necessarily say, you know, I'm going to run something one place and keep it there forever, right? As business needs change and I need changes in the criteria and the, and the characteristics that I'm looking for my workload to have, that's really what hypercloud architecture is all about. So we're going to talk about what that means then in terms of how do I then use this hyper cloud architecture framework to think about actually modernizing the applications that I may have on-prem 
so that they can be, you know, first class citizens, as I like to say, of, of this, you know, new cloud world. And, and that's really what we're going to kind of dig into. Uh, another aspect of that, maybe a little more uh, recent data uh, uh, than 2018 report, uh, is, is something that came out from Deloitte, you know, and this is uh, an excerpt I took from uh, one of the Forbes articles, but, you know, six more, six most important tech trends, right, for 2023. And, uh, you know, they sum it up pretty much rather than rip and replace legacy core systems, businesses are increasingly looking to link them to emerging technologies using innovative new connectors so that each family of systems can do what it does best, right? Again, back to the concept of business performance. And really, you know, what Deloitte is saying here is, is, is not anything new. I mean, we had, you know, most of the major analysts have come out with something similar. Forrester just had something, I think, last year. Um, I think Gartner obviously has this concept around digital business platform. Um, and, and it very much aligns to this thinking around hyper cloud and, or, uh, excuse me, yeah, hyper cloud architecture and, and leveraging those, uh, what we might call legacy. I like to call them heritage, but legacy. Uh, applications. Um, and then even down to uh, IDC, I think IDC had reports in uh, 2018, I think was the first in 2017, 2018, uh, the business value of the connected mainframe. And then they came out with an update to that in 2020, I believe, that was all about the business value of the transformative mainframe. So you can see again, you know, the idea that the mainframe from a technology standpoint is old it is not a given. Because, you know, if you look at the newest one we just came out with, the Z16, I mean, obviously, there's, there's a, a new processor on there, the Telem chip, is, is probably the, one of the number ones for AI in processing AI applications and, and uh, you know, routing your AI logic there. You can bring your Onyx models right over. So, so there's a lot of application capability on the mainframe. Challenge we have is that, as I like to say, you know, uh, new is easier because I can build something based on the requirements I want today. But guess what? When those requirements change, well, then I have to start looking at what I'm going to do with that. And I think some of us, uh, from an organization standpoint, uh, have kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit on some of our mainframe workloads and, and even our power workloads, and mid-system workloads, right? And haven't really upgraded the platforms uh, where we needed to. Uh, and so now we're, we're looking at a bigger gap. Some call it technical debt. I think it's really just a matter of... Uh, you know, targeting a plan forward and, and being able to execute that. So that's so that's what we're really talking about. Um, and we think again, hyper cloud is from an architecture standpoint is the best way to think about this, best way to execute on this. Um, again, it varies a little bit from the idea of multi cloud, but like I said, they kind of overlap. It's uh, it's difficult in my mind to think about a hyper cloud hyper cloud architecture scenario and strategy that doesn't include multi cloud. Um, but it really has to do with, you know, a multi-cloud is obviously just more than one cloud. But, you know, there are certain things as you start thinking about the cloud dynamics that we have, right, with ecosystems and partner systems. I mean, you think about the health insurance, uh, you know, we have payers, providers and, and patients, right? It's, it's very easy to see where you may have certain things somewhat siloed on a cloud just because of the natural separation from a business perspective. So I want to be able to integrate those workloads, but I may not have the ability to actually maintain and manage and, and govern those because I don't own that infrastructure, right? Uh, and so really that's where a lot of those uh, differences between, you know, a, a multi-cloud uh, and versus a hyper-cloud. Hyper-cloud is all about trying to have that single uh, way of doing something uh, in terms of, you know, or a consistent way of doing things that's been standardized on, on various uh, technologies and open, a lot of it being open source, right? Uh, so that I can do things that uh, that are common, right? And that and that enables me to, you know, uh, unlock productivity around my developer teams in terms of how they're doing their practices. Uh, I get to protect my investment and cost, cost optimize. Now, I think, you know, when you think about cost optimization as a platform play, I think, um, you know, one of the things in my earlier life, I used to work for Lockheed Martin, and I, I ran all the, the, uh, the process improvement stuff uh, from a software integration standpoint. And, you know, one of the hardest things I had in terms of trying to get my executives to understand is that, you know, process improvement is not something that pays immediately uh, because, you know, you have to have you have to kind of set a foundation for improving and moving forward. And setting that foundation actually can sometimes make you less productive in the beginning than 
more productive. And I think cost optimization in some ways is, is similar, right? Uh, obviously, a hypercloud architecture, I think, long term is the best way to optimize your cost in terms of hypercloud compute and cloud compute across an enterprise. But setting up what those standards are, setting up that common kind of practice and platform across that whole enterprise can sometimes be, you know, a little bit of a uh, uh, less productive in the beginning, maybe in a little more initial cost to get those things established. So uh, I think it's the ability to cost optimize is really what uh, what everyone's looking for from an, from an organizational standpoint. Um, and so really then when you when you think about how we think, how we might wanna think about application modernization in this context, right? Again, I think we need to set it inside of the larger framework of leveraging to the fullest capabilities, really, and from a business standpoint, this concept of hypercloud and hypercloud architecture, right? Enterprises want to deliver digital innovation without sacrificing performance or resilience. And, and that's really what we're looking for. So cloud has moved from being this uh, where is it conversation to being what are the characteristics I need, right? What, are the, what is the criteria that I have to have for this workload and where does that that best gets satisfied from a platform perspective. And then do I have the infrastructure? Do I have the practices? Do I have the governance in place to manage that effectively and then move it if the time comes, right? If, if, it, if again, the business performance needs around that workload change such that I need to make some kind of an adjustment like that, right? Now, there are, and again, because I, you know, you, you can kind of see in this picture, it's hard to draw this picture with the dynamics that you, that I really need in here because, you know, it kind of looks like public's on the right, private's on the left, mainframe's on the left. And really it kind of just, it, it kind of ebbs and flows by workload almost, right? So this isn't a picture that represents uh, an enterprise per se. This is a picture that represents kind of the decision dynamics, right? Of what does my workload need to do? I mean, again, when you talk about performance around specifically around transaction and secure transaction processing, you can't beat the mainframe, right? But you're trying to you know, enhance your, your customer experience, which is a big one for a lot of them in the financial industry and even in the insurance industry, right? Uh, or you have a lot of digital consumers or you, you're trying to plug in. All that on the edge is, is very needed. You, you can't do those kinds of things on the back end, right? So being able to understand what I have to have in order to satisfy again what that business performance should look like around an application workload or set of workloads, even you know it even extends to a portfolio kind of analysis um, as well. And so again, you get down to the, the net of it, and that is a modern hypercloud architecture is focused less on that physical connectivity and more on supporting the portfolio of workloads across all those environments and being able to automate the deployment of those workloads to the best place that for the business purposes needed, right? So, uh, and that's really again, you know, kind of what we're we're after uh, in this in this new world, if you will. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we want to do specifically as we start looking about application modernization is what does it look like in terms of how I might get started, right? What what are the uh, what's the scope of possibilities? Uh, what kinds of technologies might there be in play? Um, and you know some of the challenges that organizations have had, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is you know in a lot of ways we kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit. We didn't modernize our practices that we're using on the mainframe. We didn't even modernize some of the technology we're using. Uh, Java uh, workload on the mainframe has increased dramatically, uh, sometimes because it's Java and they want it, you know, an application to be written in Java. Other times it's because you know as some of your mainframe people know, Java can utilize the zip engine, right? So so the MIP implications and around cost is, is, is much less and different in terms of a computing perspective. And so as a result, we have customers, for example, that are maintaining or building new Java modules to interoperate with COBOL modules within their, within their CICF systems or, or just natively on, on the platform. Again, so that I don't have to rip and replace what's already there, I can kind of augment what's there and I can enhance what's there uh, by building things that in, in a newer way in a, in a modern technology. So um, using modern technology, I should say. So when we look at these, these are kind of uh, kind of entry points, if you will, of things that we have been working with customers on uh, in getting them to, uh, to kind of move forward with this thought process and, and finding places to start creating that roadmap, right? Um, again, it 
it kind of sits on the idea of enterprise standardization and platform integration as a, as a underpinning. But then you quickly can move to things like I mentioned before, enterprise DevOps, you know, the idea of real-time monitoring and observability across all of the, the, the Z system and the cloud, the rest of the cloud infrastructure, right? Um, and that improves productivity and, and business agility. And the, the thing that's interesting in this is it's not just about, a lot of times we default when we're talking about cloud to the infrastructure view, right? We put on our infrastructure glasses because it's all about managing and, and automating the, the rolling out of applications, et cetera. But that DevOps piece is critical in the sense that it really, as those of you who know, and I, I live in this space, so I'm a little passionate about some of this, DevOps is, is not the CICD pipeline. DevOps is the culture. It's the change in the way I think about how I'm doing things. So I'm, I'm moving into this continuous improvement kind of culture. Now, in, with, with that context, then I'm building things like a CICD pipeline. So the DevOps is kind of think of it as a strategy and building pipelines is kind of the uh, tactical way we're going to start executing that strategy, right? And, and for many organizations, we started all of that in the distributed side, again, because it was easy. It was easier. It's newer, it's easier. Right. And we have older systems or we have older uh, tools and older solutions on the back end. We have old practices that align to those. Uh, I, I laugh because I, I, you know, I started as an assembler developer many, many years ago. And, and people tell me, oh, well, we use this tool in a certain way because that's our process. And I have to chuckle. I'm like, no, that's not your process. That's the only way the tool works. <laughs> so, so you really don't have any other options. Right. And if you do customize things, right, well, then you kind of break it. And then I can't, you know, upgrade kind of like ERPs or CRMs. You know, it gets hard to move to the next versions if I customize too much on some of that stuff. So so those are the kinds of places that we find ourselves in a lot of times from an organizational standpoint. But that doesn't mean that we can't start taking steps, right? Some things are going to be near term. Some things are going to be a longer term. But all of it can be part of that roadmap. And so these are just some entry points. So I think in the first one there, I think the one that, that gives you good dividends long term is that DevOps focus, right? Helping your developers make changes in a way that's modern. So, you know, you're not doing it in the old style where you used to do two or three releases a year, right? Now you're, you're able to, to, to release with the speed that you need from a cloud perspective, right? Now, will you need to be as, as deliver as quickly as you do on a mobile app? No, but, the, but that's not really the question. The question is, can I, if, if I have to? Right. That's where we want that resiliency and that, that flexibility. And that kind of leads us to the next one. Right. Which is the idea of automating, uh, again, the more of the operation side and the IT automation across the OS and cloud. So being able to orchestrate across, you know, those cloud technologies that, that you're selecting in most cases driven, you know, using open source as, as a base for that um, and, and then leveraging things like Python and Ansible and some of those things in a consistent way across that whole architecture. Uh, the next one is simplifying access to mainframe applications. I think in many ways we've seen organizations do this one. It's kind of the low-hanging fruit, uh, if you will. It's an easy way to get started in many cases because uh, you're not having to refactor anything on the back end. You're not rewriting certain modules you know, within a, a monolithic application. You're simply trying to get at uh, chunks of functionality and or data uh, via using REST calls and, and APIs, right? So. So that's a strategy that, uh, that that we have, and we have some solutions, uh, you know, to respond to that as well. Unlocking mainframe data is similar. Uh, we do have something that's kind of unique there, so I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then I mentioned earlier the AI-driven insights at scale, right? So again, having something like you know the power of uh, a Z16 mainframe that can also drive a lot of your IA capabilities in terms of analysis and insights is is really really beneficial in terms of again. Uh, broader business performance. So we're going to look at some of those things. Um, we also did just announce uh, recently some, uh, within the past year or so, some some partnerships. Um, obviously, also partnered with IBM Cloud. <laughs> They're within our company, so I didn't put that one on here. But we have made announcements with Azure and AWS from a public cloud perspective. Uh, you'll be seeing more about those coming over the next couple of months in terms of offerings and, and how we're working together. Um, the one uh, I think that's most recent is AWS. You can see the link there. We, you can actually, uh, the, the main product and solution set suite, if you will, that I'm going to talk about today uh, is available on AWS Marketplace. So you can actually buy it uh, and, and draw down on your EDP if you have an EDP with, uh, with AWS. So it's all very exciting. I think, you know, we're, even, even the hyperscalers are starting to realize, you know, that organizations aren't going to be able to get all this stuff off-prem, off nor should they. 
Uh, and so now we need to start thinking about what's the best way to leverage this based on what, what the business performance is that I need. So when we look into kind of peel back the covers of, uh, of this solution, it, it's really a stack. It's a suite of technologies and it's called IBM Z and cloud modernization stack, right? And it's a, a single way. And it, it, if you're familiar with IBM cloud packs, they, they license similarly in the sense that you have a virtual um, um, processor core kind of license. And then you can apply that to any of these technologies. You know, you can apply just to one or you can apply to a couple or you can apply across all of them. Right. So uh, so that's kind of how that works. And from a functionality standpoint, these are the key areas or key elements. But there are other aspects within the suite that we package with it. Right. So um, obviously this is optimized for OpenShift, uh, Red Hat OpenShift uh, platform, container platform. And uh, within that, you also have support for things like Python and, and like I said, Ansible and C and, and C or um, uh, Node.js and even Go, Go runs on the platform now. So all of the things that you might need from a, a utilities perspective, a lot of the automation capabilities and utilities are also packaged in this. They don't consume a license trick, so they don't consume the VPCs, which is why I didn't really list them here. So these are the elements, if you will, that, uh, that, that basically pull a license uh, in order to use the, uh, the, the solution. Uh, as you see, and we'll go into more detail on these, we have uh, capabilities for, like I said, creating those APIs. Uh, very much in a, in a low code kind of way. We also have uh, the middle box, which is very focused on that, you know, enabling the ICD pipeline for ZOS development and, and even leveraging a cloud native way of doing that. Right. And we'll, we'll talk more uh, detail about that. And then uh, automating across ZOS and, and AWS in this, this example or Azure. Uh, again, you know, I, I'm using AWS to stay consistent through this deck, but but you can interchange that with some of the capabilities with Azure and obviously uh, with IBM Cloud as well, right? So, uh, so let's let's peel this back a little bit. Um, the first one that we kind of run into, and a, a lot of these sometimes referred to these as patterns. I, I think they're a little more like use cases or scenarios, right? Uh, but we're gonna, you know, you can kind of see here in the picture. It's, it's not what I'd call a complete exhaustive reference architecture kind of thing, but just, you know, big animal pictures. So you can kind of see, you know, how these things work. Uh, and again, I think the first one is one I think that a lot of we see a lot of organizations kind of getting started with. Right. As you think about a modernization journey, they uh, you know, you need to think about your landscape, think about your requirements from an application workload and portfolio perspective. And then you start to say, OK, now, how can I get some early returns on moving forward? APIs, RESTful services, that, that's probably the best way to, to move forward with that. Right. Um, and so this gives you this this particular uh, solution or, or product within the solution suite. ZOS Connect gives you the capability to do that. Right. So so you can see there you've got your core applications on prem. You have a direct connection to that cloud, public cloud uh, you know, environment where now your developers can and users even can uh, can actually leverage the tooling. Uh, it, it's very easy tooling. It's, you know, it's GUI type driven drag and drop kind of, you know, uh, tooling to build those APIs to identify functionality in ZOS. So you're still, you know, connecting back to that core system to identify those pieces uh, and then create those APIs. And then those APIs, because they are APIs, they, they don't have to be unique to Z. Now they are, you know, part of your API landscape, right? So whatever your API economy looks like, again, here, you know, we've got AWS. So we're highlighting the AWS uh, services that they provide, the, the API gateway and apps and, uh, um, you know, that you would be integrating with in that um, environment within within the virtual private cloud, right? So uh, that's, that's one aspect. And again, this is something that's, uh, I think, a little easier to get started with. It's just a matter of identifying some of that capability that you want to expose uh, using the tool, wrapping it and exposing it. It's low code. It generates the code that then you would need to put in in terms of and, and, and the applications you want that uh, can call the API. And then you just manage and govern those APIs like you would, you know, the rest of your, uh, uh, your API uh, landscape within your enterprise. Uh, the next one is the one I talked about uh, which I think has probably the highest long-term benefit or one of the longest term benefit. And that is the idea of actually, you know, expanding those DevOps initiatives that you have to include ZOS development, right? And, and that means being able 
to enable and unlock really the capabilities of a pipeline, a modern pipeline that can drive that cloud native kind of experience, right, for a developer. Now, what we see here is, uh, again, as we work with, with the various organizations, uh, we have a number of organizations that we've been working with. We have a we have a process called the DevOps Acceleration Program, where if you're interested, you know we we we've helped a number of customers move to a modern pipeline, um, and they now have their regular ZOS development. I'll put it that way um, is following a modern practice. In that sense, you can actually have your mainframe developers leverage this scenario in this architecture kind of that we have, or this diagram that we have here. Um, where they can, you know, do it in a cloud with no problem, just like they would on prem. They can have this running on prem, though it doesn't necessarily, you know, matter. It's, 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 uh, you know, actualized for anywhere you want to run it in a, in a true hybrid cloud architecture kind of, you know, approach. Um, but what we also see is that, you know, if you kind of think of it as, you know, the, the things that we have on prem today that, that were on prem before cloud, right? Uh, those need to be what I would call cloud enabled. Uh, I, I think the development practice falls into that. Uh, we, you know, the, we still have some customers, not many, but there's a few that still use ISPF, for example, uh, as an editor, right? They still use library managers to do source control management. Uh, those are older ways of doing things, slower ways, and they don't integrate with anything from a hyper cloud architecture perspective, right? So being able to modernize that practice is a critical piece. and that's one of the things I think that, um, you know, we start to look at in terms of where a, a customer can move to. So cloud enable that, right? But that doesn't mean that you can't have, you know, distributed development teams today, like a Java team today that's building Java applications, right? Target a Java application and build it to have it run in ZOS. Again, back to what I was talking about before. Matter of fact, we have a customer I was talking to a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, they're building some AI applications, right? And they're going to target back to the mainframe. Uh, so they're bringing their Onyx stuff. And, and, and all those developers are working in a, uh, a, a public cloud kind of environment, right? So they're not, they don't have to work on the mainframe. They can work in this uh, because you've enabled this now and you've unlocked this capability for them. But again, the main goal would be to try to move that because specifically if you're going to look at the context we're talking here, which is application modernization, as I mentioned in the, in the kind of the entry point before, the use case before, APIs are kind of an easy way to get started. You can get some early fruit, but at some point you may need to rewrite some modules. You may need to refactor some, some uh, and modularize some aspects of those, of those applications. If your traditional way of doing change, <laughs> of, of pushing changes through on, on an application, it's still following the process you deliver two, three releases a year. That is way too slow. Your your application modernization effort is going to take forever. So that's why, again, I think this, this is a multiplier. If we start getting this right and start unlocking the ability for our ZOS developers to do ZOS development in the same way as their distributed counterparts, you automatically unlock the ability to do application modernization at much more scale than before, right? So there's there's the idea of leveraging and 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 being able to uh, you know enable more teams to build for the platform, but you also have the ability to actually uh, increase your ability to do the actual application modernization if it's going in and, and refactoring and modularizing or moving them to more of a microservices kind of a of an approach. And we have a number, like I said, a number of customers do the same. We have a program to help them if, if you're interested. I I can help you with that. Then uh, the next use case or kind of entry point uh, customers are looking at is is this idea around uh, enterprise automation again across the OS and it, and there's a common theme here a common thread um, and it really is about uh, integrating if you will or moving the mainframe into what you're doing elsewhere right it's just making it a part of how you're managing your your cloud enterprise today. Uh, and that does mean, though, that sometimes you have to make some changes, uh, how you're doing that. And that's what modernization is really all about. You know, so uh, so in this specific case, you know, when you think about automating in the sense of being able to do things like provisioning and, and a lot of the operational automation aspects we do, scripting is huge now uh, in terms of how we enable a lot of this automation capability. 
but on the mainframe, you know, if it wasn't Rex or, or JCL, right? I mean, we, we, there weren't a lot of extra scripting now. Well, now you can do the other things, right? You can use Anthem, uh, Ansible, you can use Python, you can, and, and, and what we have here is some capabilities, uh, specifically even with a broker and within a, a, a utility that we have in there called uh, Package Manager, right? Where you can start to uh, do things at a menu level that you normally would have to only rely on system admin to be able to do. So, for example, like doing a a, a simple lesson. is a real good benefit or a real good uh, use case around something like this, right? So so think about your users being able to vision things in a self-provisioning way that also extends itself to the mainframe, right? And again, leveraging that with something like Ansible, where what you're getting in this package is a, a whole set of certified Ansible collections, right, that you probably are, are already using in other places. And again, you just extend that uh, to the OS. Um, and so then, you know, when we, we talk about this next one, this next one is actually, uh, it, it's not actually re released yet. Uh, it'll probably be released in the next couple of months as, a, as an official product. We have a couple of customers that have been using it uh, in kind of a beta, early, early uh, sponsored user kind of a, a, a plan. And it's called the uh, Digital Integration Hub, but it, it's really a, a a very effective way of, of being able to get at some of the data that sits on the back end without having to do all this copy everything over to a data lake or, you know, uh, it, you know, doing all of that moving of my data, which which causes some security problems. It's very cost to, to run those jobs to get data moved. And then your data is not real time either way. Right. Um, and so you're, you're always having to deal with differences between them. And so you're running sync services and, uh, or you're just re, uh, you know, relating the, the data again multiple times. So, so when when you look at something like this, which is really the ability to have uh, what I would call curated and aggregated data, right? Uh, and because it's sitting on the box still, the data itself is sitting on the box. It's closely located to this where this uh, tool will be, where this hub is, so that it is real time data. Uh, only it allows you then to access that in the cache. Uh, kind of approach that's in memory. So the speed is much, much faster. And so when you think about, you know, what I might need for some of those, um, you know, edge front end uh, transaction back end on prem kinds of round trip application scenarios, right? Uh, and maybe, you know, financial transactions is a perfect example of those, right? Maybe I need to hit certain thresholds in terms of performance, right? Um, this is one of the things that might crop up and, and become something that's very, very useful for that, right? I don't excuse me, identify certain kinds of, of uh, data that needs to be retrieved and, and it hits the cache first, right? Um, a good scenario around this and, and one I think of is interesting, which is which also you know goes back to the uh, diagram that we had in the very beginning, right? That chart about all the, all the, the processing on the mainframe going up. We see this uh, specifically in the financial industry, but some, somewhat as, as well in the insurance industry and, and retail markets, but um, where the front end activity because we've improved this this consumer experience right that front end activity is driving more back end activity um, and i mean think about again the simple banking scenario you have a banking app on your mobile phone right? uh, you can go in there i can go in there at a moment's notice and check my balance right um, now, well it, it seemed like it wasn't just very many years ago to check my balance i'd have to pull off and you know find an atm somewhere or wait till i got back maybe if they had an online presence and maybe i come from my computer i could uh, you know hit a website or something um but now that i can do it with ease guess what there's more people looking at their balance right that, that's not really a transaction i'm not committing anything i just want to see what that balance is right well if you've looked at your balance uh, before within the last you know few hours or so and nothing's really changed wouldn't it be great to get that data out of a cache that's in memory than having to go back and kick off, you know, a CICS transaction again that says, bring me back, you know, your balance. So, so those are the kinds of scenarios that we start to see. And that's really the dynamic that I think hypercloud architecture starts to respond to, right? Because I can start thinking about these things in the larger context. How do, how do my, how does my compute relate to each other across an application portfolio? And that includes some of these complex applications, right? Um, so when we think about the, the next one, which is really, um, I won't spend a whole lot of time here because I, I want to uh, be conscious of time, 
but you know we we also have a hybrid storage uh, kind of uh, capability because of the fact that you know on-prem storage can sometimes be a little pricey, especially when what we're trying to do is is really hold some you know cold storage as a lot of people refer to it or archival kinds of data, right? Um, you're in, uh, uh, financial services or you're in insurance or some of these other even healthcare, right? Uh, and you have requirements about how long data has to be, you know, retained. Uh, you're not going to do anything with that, or chances are very slim, you know, that the data you had from seven years ago or five years ago, that you're going to do any processing with it, but you need to keep it. Um, and you want to do it in a way that's cost effective and is also secure, right? So this is kind of another option then that allows you to do that. And instead of having a, a, a tape on-prem, you have basically this way to connect to storage in the public cloud. Uh, with with the uh, public cloud prices and the cost model, sometimes storage is not very much, um, and so sometimes this seems this can be a, an easier way and a more cost effective way, uh, depending on your plans and everything. And again, in the same idea as the rest of the hyper cloud architecture kind of conversation, what's best for business performance? And business performance can mean I have to get at this data, but I'm not really processing this data. So what's the best and lowest cost and easiest way for me to store it somewhere, right? And that's kind of where uh, where this fits in. Uh, so when we when we look to how this kind of all starts to map together, right? We have uh, I, I thought I'd take you through a client here that uh, uh, we and this is an Australian bank, and we have many of these, uh, just so you know. But uh, and this one happens to be uh, AWS as their cloud provider, so that's what I've got it on here, just to kind of keep the uh, you know examples kind of consistent. You could have Azure, as I mentioned before. You could have IBM Cloud. Or any of the other localized um, uh, providers that have certain services that are very uh, valuable for for certain kinds of workloads. So it's it's not always the big three or Google. Um, it may be some other local providers uh, specifically, right? Um, but as you start to look at this, right, uh, the the very first thing is really kind of you know, thinking about what that modernization roadmap needs to look like, right? Um, and as I mentioned before, and I really can't stress this enough, it, that kind of has to sit within the larger business model around what do I need a hyper cloud strategy to, to do for me, right? Because the hyper cloud strategy vision is what's going to drive you actually putting together the hyper cloud architecture, right? Uh, and that architecture has to support then what your application workloads need to be doing in terms of performance and, and the data that goes with them, right? And so when you look at that and you look at where best should that be, and then you start to work through the trade-offs, right? Uh, one of the things I used to tell my kids all the time growing up, right? Life is full of trade-offs. So, you know, you just have to pick which ones and expect the fact that, you know, you're going to pay something for it, right? And that's that's the process that we go through. And really what we see, uh, you know, in hyper cloud today is and as we saw in some of those earlier graphs, right? Is is there's a, there's a lot of flexing and, and contracting going on because organizations are looking for the best places to have that workload. A lot of them went, I got to get it off, and then they found out I couldn't get it off, or when I got it off, it didn't perform very well, right? Uh, and it cost me three times as much to rewrite it as I thought it would, right? And and and, and so now I've really kind of made a mess, uh, and now I need to go look at bare metal computing in the cloud because. I've lost my performance, you know, so so we're doing things based on where we are. And and those trade-off kinds of conversations have to be put in the context of, you know, that larger business performance across the portfolio. What does the business need? And then how does that fit into how I'm architecting the enterprise from a hyper cloud specifically view? Right. But but it's broader than that. It's across the whole enterprise. Again, it could incorporate multi-cloud aspects that aren't part of a uh, uh, consistently managed hyper cloud. They're just an isolated, but they're part of it, right? So I need to have as part of my performance, how can I integrate with that, you know, with with, uh, uh, with the best scalability or performance that I need for, again, that workload. So taking all those things into consideration, then you start to define what your roadmap needs to be, right? What are the things I need to go? And this has some prioritization to it, right? So, you know, targeting what kind of models I'm looking at, right? What are my critical... Uh, paths in terms of it meeting and responding to competitive pressures or to uh, my strategy in terms of new products that I want to get out by a certain amount of time because they're going to drive X number of new customers or whatever that might be, right? Uh, so those are the things that you, you kind of look at and then you start to develop that roadmap. Uh, 
one of the things I, I caution people on is, you know, in the tech world, you know, we're, we're really big as technologists are really big on make, making these plans. Right. And everybody was always I remember, you know, back back in my prime when I was doing this stuff from an architecture standpoint, we're, we're we're always back making these three year, five year, seven year plans and all that. And we always go back to our plans. Well, you know, I mean, that's the whole point of it. Right. Plans change. Plans are made to change. Plans give us a, a view from where we are and where we think we need to go. But guess what? That view of where we are and where we need to go may change. And so we have to be able to have plans that are just as flexible as the technology and the architecture we're trying to establish. Right. So a cautionary tale, you know, don't don't create these things and then and then think, you know, we're going to follow this to the letter because, you know, next year you may it may look a little bit different. Right. And it needs to. Uh, and, and anyway, then, then you start to look at where, you know, where am I going to start uh, looking at digital assets? How am I going to start leveraging them? What can I leverage today? And does it make sense to move those to public clouds? Do I need to, because of performance, move some of that on-prem cloud uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, on, you know, in, in uh, more like a mainframe or a mid, mid-tier kind of a, a scenario? And then I look at what I have on-prem that needs to be modernized. Now, again, this is very similar to the SOA kind of mentality. We, the, the, the wrong thing would be to go in and say, I need to modernize everything on my mainframe, right? I shouldn't say wrong thing, but the, the, uh, the not the best approach, right? Um, because you don't need everything on your mainframe to operate with the highest performance and, you know, et cetera. There's going to be a few things that really kind of come up, bubble up. They're the crown jewels. They're the critical apps. You got to, you got to modernize those, right? Uh, last statistics we had is, is most people, when they go in to modernize an application, they're really only changing about 20% of the code. That's really all that's needed, which is why some of these large rewrites are really just you know, way overpaid, right? Because you're going to take a lot of risk. You're going to take a lot of cost and a lot of time doing something you probably don't need to do. Uh, so think about what is that 20%, if you use that 80-20 rule, what is that 20% that we need to modernize? And why do we need to modernize it? What do we need to connect it to? And that's going to help us define the roadmap within the roadmap, if you will, of what does my mainframe modernization plan look like in, ter- in, the, in the terms of the larger uh, plan that I have across the enterprise, right? And then you start checking, you know, some of that capability. That at least that's what these guys did, right? In terms of what technology we have in place, uh, we already have in the public cloud. How do we leverage that? How do we extend that? Because again, you know, when you when you think hyper cloud. You want to do things as consistently and in as common a way as possible. Uh, and that's really the key to that, right? Um, and so when you, when you think about all of that and you start to, you know, understand how this fits in to that larger kind of uh, idea, uh, then you really start to go to a concept of what they're looking for in terms of their client outcomes, right? So this particular bank, you know, they, they obviously had much more scalability from a cloud native architecture perspective. And that allowed them to do some things with agility and speed, which which you would you know you would expect that right. That's that's kind of the promise, right? Enhancing their capabilities. Um, I, I will say that you know we've got listed in there that that they uh, their projects sped up in terms of testing, fifty uh, percent faster. That also includes the fact that they were testing more often, right? So you you basically have then uh, either you know a maintaining of or increase in quality. Uh, because again, that's that's kind of a, a proven practice around around testing and, and doing things in an agile way, and then leveraging those cloud services, right? Uh, it again, it you, you want to do things not in isolation. So you, you, and and I think again that I, I can't overemphasize enough here the the key of of looking at the technologies you're leveraging that you're already making decisions around and trying to extend those as much as possible across that architecture. Now, you may decide, and we, we have a number of customers, and I'll give this an example. I know this is probably a sore spot for, for some folks, right? But obviously, when you think about Kubernetes or something like that, right? Rancher is, is, is pretty low cost, pretty easy to work with. Uh, there's some capabilities in it, though, from a management standpoint that may not be as good as something like OpenShift, right? Well, you may have a strategy that started with Rancher. Let's just be honest, right? And you're moving forward with that because it was the best way to get in. It was low cost. You could start to establish some things, figure out what you needed your automation to do in terms of that portability and your containerization strategies, et cetera. But then at some point you come to a place and you realize, you know, for certain workloads, I really need the extra value that I get from that managed, other managed, uh, you know, uh, middleware, if you were a middle tier, right? And 
so OpenShift starts to look more you know, more uh, of value for you, it's maybe specifically initially for those certain kinds of workloads, right? But again, that's kind of the process. So, you know, again, you don't want to just say, you know, this is the technology you use and throw it, you know, uh, and again, another one of the things we do as technologists, sometimes we, we, we treat technology like it's religion, right? This is the church I go to and I'm not going to any other church. Uh, you know, we need to start making things and, and uh, decisions based on, again, business performance. And that means, you know, our, our view of certain kinds of technology may, uh, may change, may shift a little bit, right? So, um, that's kind of their customer journey. And, and I think we've, we've been dealing with very, very uh, many customers that have kind of done the same thing or similar things. Uh, we have a lot of resources available to help. You have a lot of teams that are focused on modernizing various aspects of the environments that you have and getting them to work with things like, uh, you know, uh, AWS and, and uh, pro, um, applications that you might have on, on public cloud. And so, you know, we have a red paper, we'll, which will soon be a red book on uh, on April 1st. That'll be available for you to uh, to jump in and, and get a hold of. So, uh, you know, when you when you start thinking about how you're looking at this and whether or not uh, you want to move forward with any of these or what might be the best way forward. Right. I would encourage you. It, it'll. Uh, it'll cover some of the things I've already covered today, uh, but there'll be a little bit more detail around uh, how you might get forward, uh, get moving on some of these things. Uh, again, some entry points. So if, if your key focus is around integration, you know, you can kind of go there and start there and then maybe go back to the book a little later on when you start thinking about DevOps or, or maybe even the, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the hyper data uh, hub capability. So with that, let me, uh, uh, let me look and see. I don't know if I, I meant to tell you probably earlier that we, you know, I would try and take some questions if there are any. So go ahead and, you know, feel free to uh, to type something over there in the chat. Um, and uh, for the time we have left, I, I can try and uh, uh, address any of those. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Uh, so, yeah, if you've got any questions, we do have uh, a little over five left if you want to pop some questions in the chat for Kirk um, while, while we've got him. We will also have um, office hours at 2.30. Um, so far, Kirk, I don't see anything in the in the chat yet, but um, appreciate okay. the dive. It's, uh, I, it, it's fun to see. I, I also started uh, my IBM career on, on mainframe, so um, also a few years ago. So uh, I, it's, uh, it's fun to see that it's, uh, it's still around and kicking and, and a, a very vital part of our, our customers' journeys. So, um, yeah, interesting stuff. And it's, it's interesting. One of the things I, I do get questions for um, uh, quite often, so I'll just, I'll just pretend like somebody asked it. Um, because in, in some of the slides when we're talking about modernizing mainframe, a lot of times you'll see from a Z perspective, we talk about migration. Um, which, which is confusing for some people because they think, you know, modernization from a cloud perspective, modernization always equaled migration, move the workload over. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, in, in some of the conversation is that we, we sometimes on the mainframe have things that have been around way too long. <laughs> and we do, we, we do a practice around those that we can't modernize until we replace those. So sometimes migration is migration on the mainframe. Or, for example, you know, one of the things that, that, that comes up a lot is migrating customers from their library manager. They're using the library manager still. You know, as you know, library managers, that source code stays on-prem on the, 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 uh, the, the mainframe. Well, if you, if you move to a new, we advocate moving to a new Git-based workflow, right, and, and use that from a source control perspective, and that's off. Right. So you're starting to use some of those tools that are not on prem. So, yeah, there is a migration of where your source code is going to go. Right. And there's going to be a practice change. That's what's going to enable that practice change. Right. But you're still using it to support the workload that still sits on there. So. So, again, we really have this true kind of hybrid thinking that says just because it's on the mainframe today doesn't mean I can I don't that it's not a good move to move it off. But just because I move it off doesn't mean I'm anti mainframe. I may be doing things right. off the frame to help me manage and, and, and build and enhance things that are on the mainframe. And I think for a lot of people, both mainframe and non-frame, getting their head around that is a difficult, uh, difficult to have. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you, Kirk. Really appreciate you walking us through all that. Um, if if we could go ahead and post the uh, poll. Uh, for those of you who are on, please take a look at your chat. You should get a poll about um, uh, about this session. Please give us some uh, some feedback and comments. We'd love to hear uh, you know how we can better utilize your time. Like I mentioned, we will have office hours. Um, we've got one session left to go in the day, and then we'll open it up for office hours where you can come on and um, have just open discussions. Everyone can uh, can uh, unmute themselves and and speak if they if they so choose. And with that, we've got about uh, about 10 minutes till our next session, our final session of the day. So um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for spending your time uh, over the last three days with us. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in the last session in about 10 minutes. Great. Thank you all.